right. Got a few more kids, and that's exciting to see. Amen? Amen. You keep praying for that, okay? All right. Well, I'm excited to share today's message. Um, I'm always excited to preach, by the way. I just love doing it. It's probably my favorite thing. Uh, right next to like financial challenges for the church, this is my favorite thing. And uh, I'm kidding. This is by far my favorite thing. And um, we started a series called Passion Places. And uh, I had our assistant superintendent this past weekend ask me, hey, what are you preaching on lately? And uh, uh, I said, we're, we're doing a series. And I guess he'd never heard of this before. We're, we're doing a series on the different locations of that last week of Jesus' life. And we're kind of bouncing around from event to event, from location to location, and we're calling it Passion Places. And this morning, I want to direct our attention to the book of Matthew. And the title of our message today is The Road to the Cross. The Road to the Cross. Now, setting up our story today, I'm going to back up just a little bit before we read the scripture. And going into today's text, Jesus has had his last supper with the disciples. He has gone to the garden to pray. He has been arrested by the the soldiers. He has been put on trial, uh, or maybe we should call it a kangaroo court for what he was involved in there. He was brought before Pontius Pilate, and then uh, in in a huge display of uh, what I would call legal nonsense, they had Jesus and a criminal by the name of Barabbas. And the the crowd, they stood there, and the crowd had a choice. Which of these two should we crucify? And they all demanded that Jesus, the sinless Son of God, be crucified. After that judgment, he was sentenced to death on the cross. Part of that punishment was for those who were pronounced guilty for the crime that would necessitate crucifixion, they would have to carry their own cross. I'll delve more into that. So Jesus finds himself on the road to the cross, uh, to, to actually the final destination of the cross, while he's carrying the cross beam, if you will. And there's an encounter that takes place on the road that I want to camp out on here today that I think can speak to each of us here. And so if you're able to, I'm going to invite you to stand with me for the reading of God's word. And we're going to look at this together. So here's what it says. If you don't have your Bibles, you could follow me on the screen. It says, as they were going out, they met a man from Cyrene named Simon, and they forced him to carry the cross. And they came to a place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. And just to give us a little bit more of a foundation for what I want to communicate today, I want to jump to this famous verse in Matthew chapter 16, verse 24. And it says this, When Jesus, then Jesus said to his disciples, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. And I'd like to unpack both of these verses together as we examine what happened on the road that led to Calvary, the road to the cross. Jesus, your word is anointed. Your presence is here. God, 
We trust you now that you will speak to your people. And God, that you would have your way across this place. Challenge us where we are at now, Lord. Challenge us to draw closer to you. And I'll thank you for what's done. In Jesus' name, and we all said amen. Amen. You may be seated. So what am I wanting to do today? I want to take this encounter on the road to the final destination of the cross. Now, you saw that the, the, uh, the, the story was written in the book of Matthew. It's also found in, in a couple other Gospels as well. And just to give us a little bit more insight, why don't we take a look at those verses too. Mark chapter 15 verse 21 says, A certain man from Cyrene, Simon, the father of Alexander and Rufus, was passing by on his way in from the country. And they forced him, they forced him to carry the cross. And then, again, same story, Luke chapter 23. As the soldiers led him away, they seized Simon from Cyrene, who was on his way in from the country. And they put the cross on him and made him carry it behind Jesus. That's the beauty of the Gospels, is that you get little details of the same story. They don't contradict to each other, they actually add to each other. It's, it's, it's amazing. And so here we have this picture painted for us of Jesus. Now, why did Jesus need help carrying his cross? You've got to understand that the treatment that he had endured so far, before even going to the cross, was extreme. Whipped by a cat of nine tails 39 times. Many criminals uh, would die from that punishment alone before they even got to the crucifixion. Uh, thorns thrust in his brow. Uh, mocked, beaten, spit on. I mean, this has been very physically taxing on Jesus I would dare say also spiritually taxing on Jesus. And if you remember from last week when we talked about the garden, Jesus was in immense sorrow because of what he was about to face while he was praying. So there's a lot going on that would contribute to why Jesus was so weak. And so he obviously struggled to be able to carry his cross like most who were facing the, the death penalty would have to do. And so what did they do? They grabbed this man who is from Cyrene, and I'll get more to that in just a little bit, and had him carry the cross. And again, I'm reminded that Jesus said, if anyone wants to be my disciple, he must first take up his cross, deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. I think we fail as American Christians sometimes, if I may be somewhat direct with you today. I think we have diminished what it means to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. We've greatly diminished it. I'm a follower of Jesus. Really? Well, and I'm going to say this right now. Discipleship does not take place unless there is transformation. If the Lord has transformed your life, then you have been discipled. What happens a lot with American Christianity, we pray the prayer, right? And we give our lives, or we, we, we just don't want to go to hell, okay? So, so we get holy fire insurance, but we don't want Jesus to transform us. And this taking up your cross and following Jesus, that is an explanation of our becoming a disciple of Jesus. You see, asking Jesus to forgive us of our sins is not the end, you've heard me say this, it is the start. It's not the finish line to the race. It is the starting blocks of the race. And from that, there comes a time where Jesus transforms us. 
little by little, or for some of us, a lot by a lot. And ever so slowly or quickly, however we let him do it, we become more like him. And can I tell you, I gave my life to Jesus when I was only nine years old. So that's like 20 years ago or so. And so when I gave my life to Christ, or so, okay, don't judge. So when I gave my life to Christ, uh, I had this idea that, well, okay, that's all. That's all. I, I was even taught for a while, well, that's all you got to do. You don't have to change or nothing. Well... That was incomplete. The Lord wanted me to take up my cross. The Lord wanted me to become more and more like Him. And <laughs> I've learned in my journey, this many years since I gave my life to Jesus as a boy, that He's still working on me. How about you? There's still... <laughs> There's still some rough edges he's got to file away with me. And I'm constantly being transformed. And I'm constantly trying to become like him every single day. But we, we have made become a disciple of Jesus so much about avoiding hell that we forget that following Jesus is actually trying to become like him. Letting him change us and transform us and do what he wants in us and through us and for us. And to be honest with you, that's not always easy. I go back to Simon. You see, when, when, when Simon took up that cross, that was not a necklace he was putting on. And I want to look at that story on the road with Simon. Because when we choose to become a disciple of Jesus... There is quite a weight that we assume on our shoulders. And again, some people don't like to preach on this because we just want, we just want people to pray the prayer. And, and yes, there's room for people to give their lives to Christ. Hallelujah for that. Heaven rejoices when that happens, right? Right, right? But, but we, we dare not stall in any part of that journey. There is a weight just as Simon put a weight on his shoulders physically, there is a weight that we put on ourselves when we choose to become disciples of Christ. One, I show you what some of those weights are. If you're a Sesame Street fan, this is brought to you by the letter D. D-I-S, but who's counting? First of all, there's disruption. <laughs> there's disruption. You see, for those of you who thought that when you became a follower of Jesus Christ, that you were then to fit Jesus into your schedule, I've got news for you. This story of Simon was not Simon fitting Jesus into his schedule. Simon was from a country named Cyrene. We just, we just read that. That would be today's Tripoli, okay? He was doing what the rest of the Jewish world was doing. They would, uh, during Passover, what would they do? They would come from all over the world, uh, all over the lands, and they would make a pilgrimage to Jerusalem to celebrate Passover. So this was a big, big holiday, if you will. A big festival where people would all come together from all over the place to come together and worship. And so here is Simon of Cyrene, and he is on his way to make a pilgrimage. He's thinking, well, here I go. All right, we've got... I don't know if he had his kids with him or not, but uh, maybe he did. But at least he himself was on his way to make this pilgrimage. And all of a sudden, hey, you. And they, 
They seized him, the scripture says. They didn't ask for a volunteer. Anybody want to help the guy carry his cross? Show of hands. That's not what they did. They found Simon, grabbed him, and said, you're carrying the cross. That's not convenient. That is disruptive. See, the timing of this was anything but convenient for Simon. And our American style of of Christianity has almost made it so that Jesus is more of a bullet point on our task list, if he's there at all, than the one whom we follow with everything. And you see, when you get real serious about Jesus... There's times where he is going to disrupt your life. How many of you are glad you came to church today? He's going, well, okay. Uh, well, I got three more points, and so hang with me. But choosing to follow Jesus, it's not always going to be convenient. It's not. It's not a matter of cramming Jesus into my agenda. As much as it's a matter of opening my will and my life to Jesus and saying, what is your agenda for me, Jesus? Unexpectedly, Simon was chosen for this task. Sometimes unexpectedly, God will choose his people to do things or to experience things that they were not expecting. And we were rebuking Satan And really what it is, is God saying, no, 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 no. This one's from me. This is from me. I've caused this interruption in your life. I've caused this disruption. I know, I know you had plans to sleep in today. But I want to wake you up so you pray. I know you want to just be by yourself today. But there's, there's, there's somebody in the break room that needs to talk to you. Disruptions. And see, I live by the plan. I got my plan set for tomorrow. I do. Some of you are just like me. Aren't we awesome? <laughs> but tomorrow, tomorrow, I know that I've got a, a, a meeting. Another meeting. And, and, and then... I've got stuff going on at night, and then, then I've got a plan for Tuesday, and then I have, you guessed it, another meeting on Tuesday night, and it just, it's, it's awesome, it's, 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 it's cool, and then sometimes Jesus says, hold up, hold up. That waitress that's serving your food, boy, is she upset. Maybe you can be really kind to her because no one's been kind to her the whole day. Maybe you could even tell her a little bit about me. That's not convenient. Y'all hearing me? See, some of y'all thought, well, does that mean I got to go to Ecuador with Hannah and like, you know, go to the jungles? No. (laughs) But it could mean that maybe God's just wanting you to do something right here. Where you work, where you go to school. What what does God want to do in your life? He, he's been doing this for years. You've got to understand this. Look, look at some examples in the scriptures. You ready? Peter, Andrew, James, and John in the midst of their fishing business. They're catching fish for a living. Jesus says, hey, follow me. And they leave everything behind and they follow Jesus. That's disruptive. Ananias in Acts chapter 9 is in his room praying. He's heard about this guy named Saul who basically wants to kill everybody who knows Jesus or at least imprison them. And, and, and God says, hey, Ananias, oh boy, I want you to go pray for somebody. Let's do it. Who is it, God? You know that guy that wants to kill you? I want you to go to his house. Actually, I want you to go to the house that he's staying at. 
I want you to pray for him. And I want you to say some things to him. Really? That's disruptive. Paul. (laughs) Paul. Paul had his life disrupted all the time. And in Acts 27, he was even shipwrecked. That's a disruption. But yet God used the shipwreck. In Luke chapter 7, Jesus even interrupted a funeral. He laid his hands on the casket and the kid came to life. Now that's a funeral. And, and how about this? How about this? I know we're heading towards Easter. Let's not forget the Christmas story where two young people by the name of Joseph and Mary, they were doing everything correct. They were doing things the right way. And Jesus goes to this young lady. Some say she may have been as young as 14, 15 years old and said, hey, angel says, hey, that's in the message Bible. Hey, you're pregnant. What? Yes. Well, who's the father? The Holy Spirit. Now go tell your fiance. That's disruptive. But all of these examples that you see here led, these moments of inconvenience led to something incredible. They led to something holy. They led to something supernatural. Understand that sometimes God will put some disruptive moments as we follow him, and this comes with it, okay? This comes with being a disciple of Jesus. So I'm not even going to say if, when this kind of stuff happens, okay? Then you just submit to God because he's going to bring something out that's holy from that. He's going to see a Saul become a Paul. He's going to see a boy who was dead come to life. You're, you're, you're going to see a woman who was on the brink of suicide find out that somebody cares about her and she can go on. You're going to find out that maybe making a difference in that one person's life with that one conversation made all the difference in the world for that individual. That phone call that you get, so I... I'll be honest, I I hate phone calls sometimes. Don't you? And then they leave a voicemail. Then they text me. And then they call me again to make sure that I got the text about the voicemail that they left. I'm like, no. And you can still call me, by the way. I've got caller ID, so I can send you right to voicemail. But uh, I'm joking. I'm joking. I only do that with certain ones. And they're not in here. Um, disruptions. Disruptions. How do we handle the disruptions? It comes with being a disciple of Jesus. You want to carry the cross and follow Jesus? It's not always going to be on your timetable. I'm trying to show you the reality of being a disciple of Jesus Christ. Can you say amen? Here's the second weight. It's that of discipline. Pastor, where's the happy sermon? Discipline. Let's go back to Simon for a second. Simon has been given the task of carrying the cross beam of Jesus. And some of us don't realize how huge of a task that was. That cross beam probably weighed, you ready for this, around 300 pounds. 300 pounds. It's about two of me. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> Not even close. Not even close. That's a big cross. So he wasn't like just given this little two by four. 300 pounds? All you're doing is just making your way to Jerusalem and you just want to worship and all of a sudden, 
Boom. Hey, I'm going to disrupt your life here. Uh, carry this cross. Oh, yeah, it's not light. It weighs 300 pounds. How many of you know it took a lot of discipline and it took a lot of work and it took a lot of exertion for Simon to carry Jesus' cross? This was not an easy task. I will tell you that being a follower of Jesus is not always an easy task. Any relationship worth having takes work. And following Jesus takes work. The key to success in any relationship is how much you are willing to work at it. That goes for marriage. We're, we're, we're talking about godly earthly marriages in our Wednesday nights. Uh, uh, homes, relationships, you should be here. It's really good. And, and, but all those take work. It takes work to be a good parent. It takes work to be a good mom. And a good, good father. It, it takes a lot of work. Okay, I had to throw that in there. It takes a lot of work to be a great spouse. It takes a lot of work to be a great Christian. It's not always easy. There's a scripture when Moses had the task of trying to build a tabernacle to house the ark of the Lord. And there's scripture that I found really interesting. It was this, Exodus chapter 40, verses 33 and 34. Then Moses set up the courtyard around the tabernacle and the altar, and he put up the curtain at the entrance to the courtyard. And so Moses finished the work. Let me repeat that phrase again. So Moses finished the work. What happened? Then the cloud covered the tent of meeting, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. See, the glory of the Lord didn't happen until the work was done. Amen. Why do I got to work so hard at this, Jesus? Why isn't it just rainbows and, and unicorns and pudding? I, I, I thought it was going to be easier than this. And it, it, it takes a lot of discipline. It takes a lot of work. It takes a lot of exertion. It takes, a lot of, it takes a lot. But when you do the work, that's when the glory comes. <laughs> you want the glory of the Lord to fall on Bethel Church of Talmadge? Do the work of prayer. Do the work. I, just, I wish he'd preach better. We'd probably have revival around here. You know what? You know what? Even if, and, and nobody's saying that, at least not to my face. Uh, <laughs> maybe on social media. But, but here's the deal. Here's the deal. If we work together in prayer, that's when the glory falls. So being a follower of Jesus Christ, it takes work. Mm. And when Moses finished that hard work of building the tabernacle, that's when the glory came. It takes work, but it's worth it. It takes work, but it's worth it. What kind of work does it, what are you talking about? Does that mean they got to work in their nursery? Oh, well, maybe. Does that mean I got to help Luann rake stuff? If you can keep up with her, <laughs> good luck. But maybe this hard work, it, it requires reordering our priorities and our schedules and our finances. That's hard work. That's hard work to be a follower of Jesus. It demands changing our mindsets and some of our actions. It's not all about you. And princess, maybe you think it is. But if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, that princess tiara comes off. In fact, we'll lay every crown at the feet of Jesus. Can you say amen? It means spending more than five minutes a day with him. Can you imagine your marriage if you only spent five minutes a day with your spouse? 
Some of you are thinking, that'd be so great. (laughs) It would not be. It requires adjusting some things and making adjustments. That's hard work. We've got to push past our doubts. We have to push back our fears, our distractions with this Lord, this God that we cannot see, but it's, it's well worth it when we do so. It takes discipline. Number three, there's distress. Man, is this a feel-good message or What? Simon was not a willing volunteer in this. Would you agree? No doubt he was told, you carry the cross or else. Uh, In fact, Luke 23, 26 says they seized him. Mark and Matthew said that they forced him. It really makes you wonder. Okay, You're just coming from Cyrene. You've made a long trip, and all you're there to do is worship during the Passover. And all of a sudden, a Roman soldier, okay? This is not a Walmart greeter. This is a, of course, I've been to Walmart. That could be scary, too. But it's a, if you're a Walmart greeter, I love you. I'm just joking around, okay? But a Roman soldier, (laughs) I'm going to get an email. A Roman soldier grabs Siren. Uh, 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 Simon, Simon, yeah, let's combine it. He says, you carry this cross. You wonder. One wonders if Simon thought his future was in doubt. You wonder if he was a little bit afraid of what the future looked like. I've had moments as I'm following Jesus where I wasn't able to plan everything out the way I like to. And if you know me, I like to do that. I already talked about my plans. But then there's times where, as you're just following Jesus, you're you're not sure. You're not sure what the future is going to hold for you. As you're just obeying Him. Sometimes people are mean. Sometimes bosses are ridiculous. Sometimes even church people can get irrational. And you think, whoa, what's this going to look like for me? I'm reminded then in James chapter 4, verse 13 through 15, it says this, now listen, you who say today or tomorrow we will do this or that, uh, or go to this city or that city, spend a year there, carry on business and make money. Why, you don't even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? You're a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if it's the Lord's will, we will live and do this or that. Now, I'm not saying cash in your retirement. I'm not saying make any crazy decisions at all. But what I'm saying is that sometimes God puts us, and I will tell you without getting specific, that I've been placed there at different times where God has placed me at a spot where I thought, I don't know what this is going to look like in a year. I don't know what's going to happen here. I don't even know if I'm going to survive this. And and then I'm reminded of this verse. Where I can take comfort in saying, you know what, Lord, if it's your will, I'm good. If it's your will for me to do this or be at this place or to serve at this place or to function in this way, let it be done. And if it's not, there is something better for me. See, understand, you don't have a target on your back. God has a plan for you and his plan is good. Will you say amen to that? Let me close with this. The last weight of being a follower of Jesus Christ is what I would call the word display. (laughs) 
display. None of this was done in secret. Well, my following Jesus, that's just the personal thing, just between me and him, thanks. Try telling Simon that. Hey, carry the cross. Okay, but can we get rid of all the people? You, no, turn your head. It was public. It was seen by everybody. Seen so much that three of the gospel authors actually wrote about it. Which is interesting enough. So powerful that Simon became known for this. And this the last thing we ever hear about Simon is this moment. See, becoming a follower of Jesus Christ, I'm going to tell you right now, it's embracing a life of publicity. Jesus died publicly for me. The public should know that I am a Christian. That I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. Don't tell me go to church. Lots of people go to church. Tell me follow Jesus. The world needs authentic followers of Jesus. In fact, Jesus said this in his Sermon on the Mount. Jonathan, if you could help me. He says, you're the light of the world. A town built on a hill. It can't be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and then put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way. Let your light shine before others. Why? That they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. See, this is what we need to understand. (laughs) Because I've I've met enough people that like to let their light shine as long as it's a spotlight. (laughs) Man, that's good. Oh my goodness, just it's all about me. And and you read verse 16. And the purpose of people knowing where I stand with Christ is so they can see me and then make a healthy, good, life-changing decision to serve Jesus Christ as well. And being a follower of Jesus, that means people should know about it. Do the people at work know that you're a Christian? Do the people at work know that you're a follower of Jesus Christ? Do the people where you live know that you are a follower of Jesus Christ? Do the people on your campus know that you are a follower of Jesus Christ? If we're going to be serious about carrying this 300-pound cross, if we're going to be serious about carrying the cross, denying ourselves and following Jesus, then people need to know about it. We don't keep it private. (laughs) We keep it public. So, you know, I say these things and say that, you know, following Jesus is disruptive and and, and it's going to take discipline and hard work. And some of you are thinking, this doesn't sound really inviting. But look at this. Simon's act led to the greatest demonstration of love that mankind has ever seen. If Simon does not carry that cross, and see, and and he leads, actually, Jesus leads Simon to that hill called the place of the skull. It literally looked like a skull, the mountain did. And Simon, he may not even know what's going on. He may not even know why this guy in front of him is in trouble. All he knows, he's carrying, he's got a 300 pound weight on his shoulders. That's all he knows. And so he fulfills the task that's been asked of, uh, been commanded of him. That's a better word. Commanded of him. And Jesus is then crucified which is the greatest demonstration of love that the universe has ever seen. That happens 
because Simon contributes to that happening. Do you see what I'm saying? You might be saying, why is it all worth it? Because your act of obedience to the Lord, your decision to follow Jesus Christ, that could possibly lead to somebody's life totally being changed. It could lead to an entire family giving their lives to Christ. It could lead to a workplace putting their faith in the Lord. It could lead to an atheist who's facing disease and they know that there's one guy that they can go to and pray with that you, they don't even believe in him, but there's something about him. Simon, carry that cross. Is it worth it? You better believe it. In fact, and watch how I phrase this, the value of carrying the cross is far greater than the cost. The value is far greater than the cost. You ever purchase something and then it increased in value? Maybe like a baseball card or, or a, a stock that actually didn't tank. You know what I'm saying? You bought it at a cost, but the value increased. May I tell you, you've been bought with a price. And so yes, following Jesus, I'm going to be straight with you. It's going to cost. It's going to, it's going to take work. It'll be disruptive at times. It's going to take some uh, people knowing about you. It, 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 it's, it's not always going to be convenient. So that's going to cost you. But the value, the value, the return on that is greater than the cost, Simon, of carrying that 300-pound crossbeam. I'm talking to people that are new in their faith in Jesus. I'm talking to people that have been around Jesus for a long time. So wherever we might be in our relationship with Jesus Christ, there's a cross for you to carry today. Will you deny yourself? Take up your cross and follow him. I'm not asking you if you're saved. This is a message to the saved, to the people that already know Christ. Don't stall out there. Take that cross. And no matter what it costs you, just know that the return is immense. And that's what happened on the road to the cross. My prayer is that you would come to grips with a cross that you've been commanded to take if you want to be his follower. Will you stand with me? Now for some of us in here, we, we, we were hoping the cross beam was a little lighter. We were hoping that it wouldn't take so much discipline. We were hoping that it wouldn't be inconvenient. <laughs> we we're hoping that fewer people would know about it. Uh, and we certainly don't like uncertainties. So one of these weights might be a little hard for you to shoulder today. I might ask then that this morning you would pray to the Lord and say, God, add that weight add that weight. I've been reluctant to carry that part. Add that weight to the cross. And I'll follow you. No matter how long you've been doing this, add that weight to the cross, Lord. And I will follow you. So we could pray those kind of prayers today. Amen? And I'm going to give you a chance to do that. I'm going to ask you to pray that prayer to the Lord. Whatever weight you might be uncomfortable with, pray about that and say, God, add it knowing that I can carry that with your strength. And don't leave here until 
you've spoken to God and he's spoken to you about this and then, then walk this thing out. Because in all honesty, the biggest response to this message is not here. It's out there. So let's walk out of here carrying crosses today and tomorrow and the next day and every day thereafter. So Jesus, I'm asking you that you would speak to your people. God, there are those of us we've been around you for a long time. Others of us, we're we're still kind of new at this, but Lord, this message speaks to all of us. And we ask you, Lord, that you would help us to not shy away from the weight of a cross. And God, some of these weights are hard to navigate. But Lord, you have yet to call us to carry a cross that we could not carry without your help, with your help. So Lord, maybe walk out of here carrying maybe a heavier cross than we did when we came in here. And Jesus, I ask you that you'd remind us of that cross every day this week. And God, I'll thank you for all you do. So meet with us now, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. If you need to pray, do so right now. If God's released you or when he releases you, you can consider yourself dismissed. God bless you. You can come to this front area. You can pray at your seat. But let's just seek him today.